All right, and we are back with Divya from the Route 53 team. Divya, please tell us what we're launching today and why customers should be excited. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so today we are launching uh, Route 53 application recovery controller. Actually, we launched it on Tuesday. Um, and basically what it is, is it's uh, a capability in Route 53 that helps you recover your application uh, from failures within minutes. Yes, and sorry, before we go on, that's, uh, I also forgot to introduce David, our ASL interpreter for the segment. As you see, a lot of awesome improvements to the show, but uh, this, is, this is an awesome feature. We already got some really great feedback. Keep it coming, everybody. But yes, David is going to be taking over for ASL interpretation for this part of the segment. Welcome to the show, David. All right, Divya, back to you. So yeah, can you, can you break that down a little bit? What, what, is, what is Application Recovery Controller, and uh, what, what kind of customers should be excited about this uh, right out the gate? Sure. Um, so it, uh, application recovery controller consists of two uh, specific capabilities. Uh, one is called readiness checks. So that will help you uh, continuously monitor your application and ensure that it is always um, ready to recover. Um, and the second thing is routing controls. Um, and that is what you can use uh, in case there is um, any failure or any disruption. Uh, you can use your routing controls to quickly rebalance traffic amongst your application replicas uh, to make sure you restore the availability of your app. So um, say you, uh, you are a customer that has a critical um, e-commerce application, and you are actually responsible uh, to maintain the availability of the app. Uh, so one thing you'd want to do is in case there is um, any failure, you want to make sure that you can quickly recover your app uh, by failing it over to another um, uh, replica, whether it's in another AZ or another region. Um, so um, you can use uh, the readiness checks that's provided by application recovery controller. Um, so uh, you, know, you can use that to continuously monitor all your application replicas and make sure that there is parity amongst your application replica. So for example, if some, uh, if one of your replicas uh, does not have sufficient capacity uh, to handle the failover traffic, um, readiness checks will give you an alert so you can uh, keep scaling up your capacity. And same thing for configuration. If there's a configuration drift, uh, it'll give you um, an alert um, so that you can take proper mitigation actions. So that's one side of the picture. Um, and this is something that happens continuously. You don't have to wait for a failure to happen to ensure that your application is ready. Um, and then the second thing is what happens when an actual uh, disruption happens, like um, you know, your application has some kind of an issue in one AZ because of some uh, deployment that you did. So that's when you actually want uh, to make a recovery as simple as just pressing a button so that your traffic just fails over and you know, your application is back magically. So that's what uh, routing controls essentially does. So Divi, this sounds really powerful and super helpful to our customers. Um, but what did they actually, how did they survive before this? What, what, what was their, their system or the practices that were, if we, before they had access to this? Yeah, so uh, we've been speaking to a lot of customers, you know, um, on track to build, um, on road to build this. And one thing I've noticed is it's pretty manual. Customers use a lot of DIY solutions today. Um, uh, some customers manually uh, update DNS records, and it could be um, really error prone, especially when uh, when it's a high stress situation like a failover, like when a failure happens at that time, you don't want to be fiddling around with your DNS records. So a lot of customers actually uh, unfortunately resort to things like that, or people build um, um, some kind of safety rules and checks by um, looking up uh, your configuration in AWS config and service quotas, and then build the layer that compares all your configuration across um, replicas and make sure there's parity. So it's it it was heavily manual, and now uh, with application recovery controller, uh, you know you can let go of all that undifferentiated heavy lifting that you used to do before. Thank you, Divya. That that undifferentiated heavy lifting is one of those words that uh, I always uh, I have this nervous tick every time I hear that that <laughs> phrase. Um, so you, if you if you want to if you want to get on my nerves I, that, in a good way, I, <laughs> you can say that word. Nick and I used to play this game all the time, but but uh, but that's it's true. It's true. Uh, we have a good question in chat here uh, from Twitch. Is this similar to Route Fifty Three failover routing? Yes. Uh, so uh, think of. Uh... Uh, think of application recovery controller as a highly reliable controller for your Route 53 um, uh, failover records. So basically, Route 53 is the routing engine. That's what actually routes traffic over. But um, application recovery controller is what gives that signal 
to um, Route 53. So you can use failover records today, uh, but uh, you know it 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 does not have things like um, readiness checks to make sure that you have parity and you're ready to failover. It does not have things like um, safety rules to make sure that your failover is um, always safe. It's uh, failover uh, routing policies is kind of meant for specific components of your application when you want to fail over. Uh, application recovery control is more holistic. It's something you can use to uh, fail over your entire application or uh, a group of applications uh, in unison or in a sequence. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, Route 53 supports a couple of different um, DNS policies. I, I think we've got geo and latency based. Um, is, is there a, what, what, which ones do we support or, or do you support? Yep, uh, that's a good question. And the best part about application recovery controller is it works with any uh, and all of your um, Route 53 uh, records. Um, so you don't have to update your records to make sure that it matches what uh, application recovery supports. Uh, if you have geo or latency or even failover records, you can simply overlay application recovery controller um, on top of that and just start controlling your um, traffic shifts. Interesting. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, you know, people, customers were doing this manually with sometimes with manual uh, a DNS record, which, by the way, scares me uh, for anybody who's had to go and manually tweak DNS records. I mean, there's so this the, DNS is a complex system, despite being, you know, the backbone of the Internet. It, it is really something that you don't want to touch. So if you ever hear like manual DNS record configuration, alarm bells should be going off in your head. That's one of the scariest things to do because you can't even debug it afterward. It's just a mess. Um, so to hear the fact that we've gone in, in Route 53, not only have we had the tools in Route 53 to help customers deal with this kinds of problems, but now we're adding more and more automation and affordances and safeguards for customers to succeed here for, for failover and recovery. Uh, this to me is just fantastic. Um, but I'm wondering when customers start to use application recovery controller, how does that change their operational model? You know, I mean, what, for example, what changes do they need to make uh, to their team structure, to their organization, to how they architect their applications? Can you go through that? Yeah. Uh, so one of the design principles that we've been working backwards from is um, something called recovery-oriented computing. So what it essentially means is you want to design and operate your application in such a way that uh, no matter what the failure is, you can just simply, um, you know, uh, take that failed component of your application out, rebalance traffic, and everything just uh, worked perfectly fine. So if you're running an application like that, then you don't have to worry about the types of failures that's there. Uh, you know, you're agnostic to the failure mode, but regardless of what the failure uh, mode is, you're uh, making your recovery time predictable. Um, so in that regards, a couple of things, um, you know, uh, to keep in mind, uh, uh, for your operation model. You want to make sure that your application uh, is replicated or it has multiple copies, multiple redundant copies um, across AZs um, or even smaller units within an AZ. Um, and then once you have these redundant copies, uh, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is metrics. You want to make sure that you have uh, good uh, customer experience metrics that align with these um, redundant partitions. For example, your uh, you might have an application that is uh, that that's partitioned across AZs, but if your metrics are regional, uh, then you won't have that visibility to understand whether a particular um, application in AZ is impacted or not. You'll only have it at a regional level. And you need those kind of metrics to make sure that you can simply press a button and evacuate traffic from that uh, failed partition. Uh, so that's the second thing I would keep in mind, aligning your metrics with your partitioning strategy. Um, and the third thing to make in mind is deployments. So um, one of the uh, one of the things that I've been hearing from customers a lot is uh, the most common failure mode they experience is uh, deployment-related failures. So um, you want to make sure that when you are um, uh, doing deployments, you have an incremental uh, deployment strategy. So what that means is uh, make deployments one partition at a time. Um, uh, so you can make sure that, you know, when you're deploying to one partition, if something goes wrong, you can simply take that traffic out, fail over to another um, partition um, and, you know, things work uh, fine. So those are the three things that I would, I would call as um, things to remember from an operational standpoint. Okay, so but that that sounds awesome so far. Now, what is the experience of the customers of our customers? So let, let's say that 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 final customer is, is shopping on a website, and then the the failover happens. What 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 do they see or not see? Yep. Um, so you know, if you're an end user and you're shopping on 
let's take amazon.com um, and you know something goes wrong uh, what you could do is um, you know as, um, as the customer or um, as a service provider uh, what you can do is you can just simply press the button and fail over traffic. And what the end client would see is maybe um, a couple of minutes of, uh, you know, error, but then things would uh, work completely fine when they refresh the screen. Um, they would see their uh, their cart and, you know, their um, the, the website um, completely back um, and running. Awesome. So you, you talked about this, this need for uh, the, a backup stack with sufficient capacity um, does so help me understand here does the does the standby partition or I, I'm probably using the wrong terminology so first maybe you could tell us what the right terminology is but then do I have to have that standby environment up at all times can I have some sort of active active architecture so that I can take advantage of that reserve capacity without having a you know a, a, an entire copy of my infrastructure kind of sitting, uh, waiting to take over? Yep. Um, so firstly, I mean, I've heard customers use mul multiple names for, uh, you know, partitions, environments, um, all of that. But what it essentially is, is it's a failure containment domain. So your applications need to be replicated across multiple failure containment domains. Um, I call it partitions, but um, customers might call it, uh, you know, cells, and there are various other terminologies that I've heard. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is, um, what happens to the standby partition? Like, is it just there or can you uh, can you actually use those resources in active active mode? So uh, one thing is it depends on your application. So if you if you have critical, uh, highly transactional applications, for example, uh, you might uh, not be running it in an active active mode. Um, uh, you know, depending on your part partitioning strategy. So in that case, you want to make sure that your standby partition um, is always ready to absorb the failover traffic. So what it means is um, you, you have sufficient capacity at all times um, so that uh, when a failure occurs, it's as simple as just shifting traffic. You don't have to scale out capacity and, um, in fact, wait um, for the scaling out to happen um, for your application to recover. But having said that, a lot of customers, you know, it won't be uh, very cost effective for a lot of customers um, uh, to use um, an active standby model, especially if, you know, they have uh, applications that might be stateless uh, or they might be having uh, low volume um, uh, data in their application that does not change very frequently. So they can take advantage of an active active model. Um, so in that case, um, application recovery uh, controller supports active active as well. Um, we we still have uh, a bunch of readiness checks that we do across your active active uh, partitions to make sure that uh, you know the configurations um, are in place. Um, um, you know you you still have sufficient capacity and things like that, but you can absolutely use it for active active as well. So failures come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and scales, uh, from from something kind of really small or maybe a human error at deployment all the way up to like you know. Uh, a cell or perhaps very rarely even an, an AZ, what, what levels of failures are, are you designed for? Um, so really like, I mean, um, application recovery controller is designed for any type of failure, like you said, Jess from, uh, Jeff, from small um, deployment related failures, uh, which is actually the more common failure mode that I've been hearing from customers to even, um, you know, large scale disasters, like, uh, you know, just imagine in a worst case scenario, uh, there's a power grid failure. Um, and, you know, that could actually impact, uh, you know, one or more data centers of customers. Uh, that's also something that uh, you can use application recovery controller for. Um, there could be even client generated bugs, um, or even a networking disruption, like the client cannot connect to a particular partition, um, in which case you actually want to um, fail over those clients to another partition. So any kind of failure, really, uh, the idea is you're now agnostic to the type of failure. So you don't have to do a due diligence on what will happen if this kind of failure modes hit, uh, what what should be my recovery runbooks, it's kind of the same uh, runbook that you have uh, for any type of failure, just press a button and fail over to uh, the the next healthy partition. Uh, when we're talking about failovers, uh, uh, you know, resilient infrastructure, th this kind of space, and we've seen other things, uh, even from AWS, but, but also tools across the industry uh, perform things like uh, rollbacks and uh, roll forwards. 
Uh, can you talk real quick about that and, and maybe what happens when the, the incident has uh, been resolved? Yeah. Um, so once, uh, you know, uh, the failure has been resolved, uh, the first thing you would do is, you know, look at your readiness checks and make sure that your uh, previously unhealthy partition is back up um, and, you know, all the configuration capacities matched with um, uh, all the recovery re replica. And once you have confirmed that, uh, you can actually just um, update the state of your routing controls uh, from from standby to active, and it'll fail back uh, your traffic. You can also automate this. Uh, you can add a bunch of safety rules. We offer uh, something called safety rules, which are customer configurable rules to make sure uh, that uh, uh, your failover and failback follows a certain set of criteria. So one of the criteria can be uh, prevent uh, failback uh, if your uh, replica is not ready. So uh, you can do a bunch of stuff like that and make sure that you can fail back as well. Hmm. So we, we talked primarily about, we talked kind of about, you know, continuity in the, in the face of many, many different kinds of failures and how we do the switchover. Um, let, let's talk on the business side for just a bit. Like how, how does this affect pricing when you've got to have this standby partition wa waiting there in the wings? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the uh, in terms of pricing, like I mentioned, uh, the ideal situation is you have uh, an exact replica of your application in multiple partitions. Um, so in terms of pricing, it's going to be um, twice that amount unless you use um, cost saving strategies like reserve capacity, um, some of the reserved instances and things like that, which AWS provides. Um, and if you are a customer that, you know, where uh, uh, that's, operating in a really availability sensitive app. So think of a national payment processing app, um, which if it goes down, it can actually disrupt um, uh, the economy. It could take down like maybe a, a significant uh, portion of real time payments of that particular nation and things like that. So if, if you're operating uh, such an app, uh, you want to make sure that you're ready for recovery no matter what. So you would want to um, operate um, like a hot standby sort of a setup. But um, if you're a customer that has maybe an analytics workload, it's fine if it goes down for a few minutes, but I, I still care about availability. Like I don't want uh, it to be down for like maybe, uh, you know, more than an hour and things like that. You might be okay running it in a pilot mode or maybe your application might be able to work in a degraded mode as well when you fail over. So you can have, uh, you can operate your uh, standby in a reduced capacity. So in that case, you can, you can still use, um, application recovery controllers readiness checks uh, we will alert you that it's not there's no parity across your partitions but you can choose to um, respond to that alert only during um, a, a failure scenario then that's when you will probably scale out your standby and failover um, so you can you, you can use it in whichever way you want interesting it occurs to me that you know when you have uh, something like application recovery controller trying to improve the availability of other applications, that raises the question, how highly available is application recovery controller <laughs> itself? How, 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 is, how do you ensure that application recovery controller itself is highly available? Yeah, um, so uh, that's a good question. I have my colleague Ryan with me uh, who will be answering um, that. Hey, Ryan, can you hear us? Hi, Rob. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, Divya, thanks. Uh, we'll just uh, carry on with Ryan from here on out. Thanks for joining thanks. us on the show. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Divya. So, yeah. Rob, were oh. you asking for an application recovery recovery controller controller? <laughs> <laughs> I think they might have something more, even more clever than that. Uh, Ryan, what, what's your what's your take on that? Or do you, sure. did you hear the question? Can you repeat the question for me, Rob? Yeah, yeah. So the question is, if application recovery controller is acting as this as this uh, meta service, so to speak, that provides higher availability for other services, how is it itself highly available? That's a good question. So when we first started looking into building this product, one of our core principles is ensuring that under any circumstances, customers can do a failover, right? Um, and this question that you had was one of the first questions that, that we had when we first built the product as well. Um, and our answer to that is routing controls. Um, so DVR talked about readiness checks, which help customers ensuring that their standby partitions are ready to fail over. The other part of the equation is under like an, an extreme event, like an earthquake, for example, that data centers go down. How do you ensure that your, your failover actions actually work? Um, 
So we design routing controls with that availability mindset. Routing control is essentially a very simple on-off switch, and it ties to Route 33 health checks, which eventually tie to DNS records. When a routing control is on, the health check will be on, uh, will health check be healthy, and then it will still signify Route 33 DNS to route traffic to that partition. And the, our routing controls are actually hosted in what we call recovery clusters, which are a set of uh, infrastructure that we have across five different regions. Every, cl uh, every customer that we have will have a dedicated set of cluster, which has a uh, five different API endpoints for them to use to change the state of a routing control. And we guarantee that as long as you can talk to one single endpoint, and manage to change the state of a routing control, the DNS records will be updated behind the scene automatically. Um, and, and, and this design helps with uh, scenarios in which customers cannot even talk to, let's say, uh, North Virginia IAD region, but they can talk to other regions like PDX or even in Europe, for example. Um, and we don't, we, we use, we, Propagate the Route 33, um, our, our routing control states directly to the um, Route 33 DNS servers through health checks. And health checks, um, if, you, if you don't know how it works, we essentially have health check fleets running in eight different regions, uh, 16 different AZs. So you have like this mesh of redundancy, right? Five different regions for routing controls and 16 different AZs for health checks. Um, so even if one AZ cannot talk to one of the endpoints, that's not the end of the world. We have plenty of redundancy there. All right, so it sounds like you've got things well covered on on the AWS side. Um, when 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 you do initiate a switchover, is, is that kind of immediate point in time, or how does that how does how do things transpire? That's a good question, Jeff. So being in Route 33, we build our, our, our recovery solutions into the DNS um, stack itself. So our recovery points uh, or, or time to recovery really depends on DNS resolution. Um, the time it takes for propagating the um, routing control state to the DNS servers it typically takes less than 30 seconds. Um, but then we leave it to the application developers to define DNS TTL. Um, we, we recommend that your TTL should be less than 60 seconds for the recovery to be within two minutes window. Um, but in some cases, there's some DNS caching outside of the TTL, the outside of the DNS TTL, like your browser will probably cache it for another minute or so. So about five minutes would be like the absolute B100 uh, maximum time that we're looking for. But usually it should happen within one to two minutes. Yeah, that's... Um... That's a good call out. This, this, the fact that you know, um, and <laughs> this is a way to to configure failover of DNS records, um, but then DNS itself is kind of the the ultimate, eventually consistent system, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like you like you said, Ryan, you can have uh, intermediaries, and you know, when you perform a, a recursive DNS lookup, you might just have a server that just you know, hey, has a, an arbitrary minimum TTL that is not the TTL that you told it to to, to store. So. Um, that's what, part of what makes DNS so uh, so fun, so fun to work with. You speak my um, pain there. <laughs> sorry, yeah, we, we should note that like a, a TTL like of a minute or two is is pretty awesome compared to where we were just a decade or two ago, where most recommendations were like multiple days. Or I, I seem to remember a website I didn't like crap like 1996 maybe, with, where I think they said like put a week or 48 hours for entries. Mm -hmm. So. It took yep. utterly forever to figure out if you had all these entries configured properly. And so be, being able to do it and like set them up, change them, test them in, in hours rather than weeks is, is, is like actually pretty nice. Absolutely. In Route 33, we have uh, zero TTL as well. And a lot of our internal DNS records are actually five second TTL. So yeah, it's really awesome. Very nice. Yeah. So uh, for if I have some persistent connections to my application, let's say something like a WebSocket, uh, how does uh, application recovery controller handle that? So going back to DNS, right? Um, in order for DNS failover to actually work, you have to re-resolve the DNS record. Um, so for a persistent connection like a WebSocket, what will what the clients will have to do is to re-resolve the DNS connection. 
So in the case of a hard failure, if your application is hard down, that will happen automatically, right? Your web software connection will be reset, um, and then the client will retry with a new DNS resolution um, call to your DNS servers. So that will happen automatically. Um, but in the case that your uh, your application is experiencing some sort of degraded mode of operation and degraded failures, um, it is really up to you to figure out a way to reset um, the web socket connection that your clients are still ha hanging um, hanging on to. Usually, we can do like TCP resets to all the connections, or just kill them on the host, and and they'll be like um, the clients will do DNS resolution um, again. Mm. So th this sounds like a really amazing step forward for our customers, but I'd love to see it in action. Do you have a demo for us? Of course I have a demo. <laughs> All right. So I don't have graphs and uh, visualizations with graphs like this, but I have some diagrams. Um, so before I get to the demo, this is how you can you can find us. Under Rockery 3, um, we have a couple of services under, uh, under the Rockery 3 umbrella, and we are down here. I would love to have this uh, math organized by alphabetical order so we can go on top, but you know, um, I cannot have nice things. So we are here. Um, our Getting Started page can help you have a uh, some, some glimpses of what we do. Um, like Divya mentioned, we have two distinct features called readiness checks and routing controls. The idea for readiness checks is really to answer the question is my keyword going to be better than my disease? Is my available action going to solve the um, issues I'm having right now with my applications? Um, and we do that by allowing customers to define the failover boundaries in terms of recovery group and cells, and then defining the resources within those cells. Our readiness checks will constantly, uh, continuously check for those resources and make sure that they are ready for failover. Um, for routing control, like I, like, like I just uh, talked to a little bit, they are simple one-off uh, on and off switches that integrate directly with Rockery 3 health checks and Rockery 3 uh, uh, DNS records um, by simply using our, our multi-region um, data plane API, you can switch traffic from one partition to another in a very uh, reliable way. So let's dive into how we can set all of these things up. I have a demo application, is a tic-tac-toe uh, game. You can actually go to this uh, URL and, and play this game. It, it hopefully works. I, I, <laughs> I play with a couple, a couple of my friends and we love tic-tac-toes. Um, you can also run this demo application yourself by going to our blog, our announcement blog. Uh, just do a search, a Google search for application recovery controller and you'll get you there, or some of our teammates will push the link to uh, the, chat, the, the chat or something. Um, so this application basically runs on, um, runs with a application uh, load balancer as an entry point. And um, the load balancer routes traffic to a couple of EC3 instances in um, two, a, two different AZs. And then we use a global DynamoDB table um, to replicate data from one region to another. Right now, this application is currently live in US East 1, which is in IAD in North Virginia. Um, my demo is going to go over how we can set up the, uh, how we can set up application recovery controller to transparently and easily move traffic from IAD to a different region, let's say Portland in PDX. So the first thing that you do is you go to readiness checks and start, uh, and start defining your recovery group. Now I have my recovery group defined here as, hopefully it loads, yep, as having two different cells. Um, to, re to iterate what cells mean, they are essentially failure boundary. And we are very flexible with how customers can define their cells. Um, over here, I define it as regions. So one cell for US East 1 and one cell for US West 2. But customers can define it in AZ manner or like we do a lot internally in AWS, we define cells across uh, AZs and regions as well. Um, it really helps reducing the blast radius of a failure and contain the failure to that particular cell. Um, region is, is a pretty good bet for that cell definition. So I'm gonna use that, use that for this demo. So within these two cells, um, 
you go to each cell and start defining the resources that you use for that cell. Um, in this case, we have uh, readiness checks for ALB, for DynamoDB, and the auto scaling group, the three components that I called out um, earlier. Um, and that's, and if you want to kind of understand what we do with these readiness checks, you can go to readiness rules. Here we have like a catalog of all the readiness checks that we do. Um, so for example, auto scaling group, we do, we inspect auto scaling groups across those two cells that you define and make sure they have the same number of availability, uh, availability zones. They have the same instance size, um, the same number of instances within each auto scaling group and so on and so forth. And if um, this readiness check fails, we'll push um, a metric to CloudWatch and you can use that to alarm and take some actions. This, this is actually fascinating because this, these are just like so many things that customers would have had to actually think of a little bit ahead of time if they, if they were thinking of doing this themselves. And the, the fact that, that um, application recovery controller actually make, makes all of these readiness checks for them ahead of time, I, I think is, is pretty awesome. Yep, and all customers have to do is to give us the uh, resources that, that the customers want us to monitor, and we'll continuously monitor them, um, publish metrics to CloudWatch. And when it times to fill over, um, oops, I was not supposed to click that link. I'll go back to readiness checks. Um, when it times to fill over, you can say, um, you can go to readiness checks and see this check mark here. That means your recovery group is ready or your um, secondary cell is ready to take on the traffic. Um, that gives customers a lot of confidence with the failover action that, you know, um, the, my, my cure is going to be better than my disease. Uh, just one more question about the readiness checks, because I'm really intrigued. Uh -huh. are, are, do, is that based on the set of resources that's actually about that are ready to be failed over or can be failed over? So you're, you're, you have a long set of checks for all different kinds of AWS resources, but I'm, are, do you narrow that down to just the, the things that, that are actually present? Right, so um, like I said before, Jeff, um, in order for customers to apply the readiness checks, they will have to start, I'll probably go through the creation process here and make it a little bit clearer. Um, so let's say you want to check that your application load balancer in IAD and PDX are the same. Um, so you, you create an ALB readiness checks. And then over here, you can select the resource type. Um, uh -huh. And then you can select the classic load balancer, which then it'll allow you to um, create a, either your existing resource set or create a new one. Um, in this case, I don't have any resources. So I'll just create a new one, and that is where I can add my resource arms. So this would be the application um, load balancer arm that you want us to monitor across um, IAD and PDX. Fascinating. All right. So now that I know that my secondary partition is ready for failover, that's actually make the failover happen. Um, to do that, I'll go to routing controls. And here's, oh, before I talk about routing controls, let's talk a little bit about a cluster. So like I mentioned before, right, a cluster spans across five different regions. And when you create a cluster, we actually provision these uh, regional capacity for you. Um, and no two customers share the same cluster. And each cluster has five different endpoints in five different regions. And we guarantee that as long as you can send API requests to one of these endpoints to perform a failable action, um, we use a consensus, a consensus algorithm behind the scene that will um, make sure that your change in one endpoint are replicated to all of the other endpoints. And then the values in across all those five regions will be propagated through health checks to the DNS servers. Um, so within a cluster, we have a concept of control panels. To think of control panels as a grouping of all of the actions that you want to perform on a single um, application or multiple applications, if you want to define it that way. 
for every cluster, we have a default control panel that you can just use without having to create a new one. So you can start creating routing controls and not care about control panels. But you can also create a control panel for your application. In this case, I have one for my tic-tac-toe application, which has two routing controls. Again, the routing control represents the state of that cell, whether it can take traffic or not. So I have uh, one routing control for IAD US East 1, one routing control for US West 2. And you can see that West 2 is off and East 1 is on, which means the primary, uh, my application will now be running in IAD. So that it is consistent with the header here that we see in the application header. Um, hey, Ryan, quick question yep. before we switch over. Can you go back into the console for a second? Sure. Um, can you go back to the list of endpoints that you had for the cluster? Sure. As go. a developer, what, what would I do with this? Uh, so should I configure my application with just to pick any one or one of these endpoints at random and issue requests against that? Should I round robin? Should I like, like what, what do I do with this just as, as a matter of configuration? That's a great question. Uh, I'm very glad that you asked that. So as an application developer, um, we recommend that you pick one endpoint at random, um, but you can also pick an endpoint that provides the best latency for you. Um, if you're performing a field over action from Seattle, we probably want to pick an US West 2 endpoint first. Um, and then when you actually perform a failover action, and if that action fails for whatever reason, we can we, we give you a feedback through error codes that says um, this endpoint is temporarily unavailable, so you can try any other endpoints. And we guarantee that any point at any point in time, one endpoint will work for you. Um, and as long as that that uh, request is successful and accepted by the system, it will be replicated to all the other endpoints, and your read uh, request to all the other endpoints will have the reflected value. Got it. Got it. Okay, so. So it's a, uh, um, okay, I think I understand. Thanks. Awesome. I almost think I understand. So let, let, me, let me make sure I, I get this. So, sure. so at, the, at, at the other end of these API endpoints, there, there's an application recovery controller API. And mm -hmm. so if, if, if I'm, if I'm the running my site and, and my site is, I get an alarm that says your site's not working, I could have an app. Maybe I've got an app even on my phone and I pick up my phone. There's this big green button. And I just hit that big green button and it makes a call to the API to one of these endpoints and says like switch over to, to, to the other um, set of resources as quickly as possible. And that, yes. that's, that's the purpose of this API. Yes. Um, so that, that app that you mentioned on your phone is essentially similar to what we have here on the console. Um, so if you go to this little page, um, you, you, you can see that these are the states of my application, right? And then now I can change these states um, from on and off and off to on, whichever way you want to actually carry out the failover actions. And what we do here behind the scene on the console is we do the, we, we do the logic that I, uh, that I uh, said about, uh, that I mentioned there, which is we pick an endpoint, um, send an API request to it, if it's successful, that's great. If it's not, uh, if it doesn't succeed, then we pick another endpoint and cycle to the list of endpoints there. Um, we don't really care about latency here because when it comes to recovery, um, availability trumps latency. Um, but eventually, one endpoint will give you a successful response. Most of the time, that will be like the very first endpoint you try, but then um, the other four will be there as redundancies. And we have plenty of redundant capacity there. Mm. This is kind of mind blowing because I look at this and this is so clean and so straightforward and so powerful. And beneath this is this unbelievably complicated pyramid of multiple multiple regions and all these services and all these checks and this ability to build these really awesome applications and to know when you need to do this change, change over the routing. And all of that complexity and all that power is now is now it kind of at the top of this pyramid, just like slide the, the switch from off to on. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, that's kind of like, kind of mind blowing to me. I'm glad that you said that. That's that's our, our goal to make these kind of recovery actions very easy and, and straightforward for customers. And I hope the customers can build 
complicated architecture on top of this. We have um, we can have like a control panel with a lot of toggles, a lot of uh, con uh, routing controls there, um, with what we call safety rules to safeguard any mistakes that happen. For example, right now we have a safety rule that says um, we have to have at least one cell in the active state, which means if someone goes goes to um, our control panel here and try to turn this off, turn this all, all off, this action will not go through. We'll, um, the API endpoint in the cluster will not accept this action. Regardless of how we try, um, all of these updates happen atomically, um, so you cannot break the safety rule. Um, this comes in very different circumstances, and especially for active actives, um, a lot of our customers will say, like, if they have a, 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 um, an automation that helps automatically shift traffic away from an active cell to another, but they don't want that automation to go crazy and take out too many capacity at the time. Our safety rules are designed to safeguard against those kind of scenarios. Very, very cool. So let's, so after all of that, let's actually perform a fill over action. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, we're still, we're still using IAD as the primary partition. So let me just turn off IAD and turn on PDX. Type in confirm here and change traffic routing. So now that the API request has been successfully carried out, um, it will take some time for the state to propagate to the Raspberry Pi DNS servers. Um, so typically, that happens like one uh, within one or two minutes. So let me quickly explain how it works first before we check our application to verify the failover state. Um, so within a routing control, you can go and create a Raspberry Pi health check. Now this Raspberry 3 health check will allow you to reflect the state of a routing control to Raspberry 3 systems. Um, and then you can use the health check to associate it with the DNS record. I already have a health check created for me here. And I'll quickly run through um, again my DNS record setup to um, walk you through how the health checks can be used. So this is my Raspberry 3 host zone. Um, I'm, used, I'm, I'm running active standby architecture, so I'm using a failover Raspberry Pi DNS record with a primary and secondary DNS record. So for each DNS record, I have a Raspberry Pi health check associated with it. And this health check is the one that we create um, from the application recovery controller console. Um, the set of the health check reflects the state of a routing control behind the scene. So Let's go back to our detector application here. And hopefully, if I refresh the page, our application will be now in US West 2, which is PDX. So our failover action is successful. Yeah. Uh... And that is the end of my demo. Um, do you have any other questions? Not for me. How about you, Rob? Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm still digesting this. I, I have to play around with the service. I think I'm. I'm, I definitely feel like a dinosaur because, you know, I'm used to putting together this kind of health check, cobbling together, you know, exactly what you said these these uh, customers had to do uh, uh, before a service like this existed. So I'm excited to play around with it and uh, get a little more, a little more uh, familiar with it. But this looks really cool. I mean, clearly, a lot of customers who, who uh, run their applications and workloads on AWS are running um, mission critical workloads mm -hmm. and any tools and services that we can provide, especially uh, after applying our experience in terms of um, cloud computing and operating in uh, critical service industries, especially learning from those customers and how they succeed. I, I, I'm sure that all of those lessons are baked into uh, how you and the team have have built uh, application recovery controllers. So I think, um, uh, I mean, that's that's really kind of what we do at AWS, right? We, we kind of solve these problems at scale for customers. We gather the feedback, we turn it into a service that everyone can use on demand, uh, um, at, at, you know. So I, I love to see this this flywheel uh, uh, every time it goes around, and it seems like um, this is a, a pretty big leap forward here. Yeah, totally, Rob. And just to re reiterate the point, um, AWS we have experiences doing exactly this for ten plus years. 
So essentially what we're doing with application recovery controller is to make recovery oriented computing really easy and um, make it really available to everybody. Um, we take all the uh, experiences and the learnings that we run AWS services throughout the years and bundle that into some sort of um, tools and very use, easy to use um, uh, you know, uh, guidelines that customers can follow. Um, things like cellular architecture is definitely one thing that we would love to see customers uh, make use of application recovery control, uh, controller for. Um, and also, you know, just thinking that your application can fail at any different point in time and prepare ahead for it is a great mindset change that we at AWS does very often. And I would love uh, um, customers to start adopting it as well. Absolutely. Well said, Ryan. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you for showing us this demo, Ryan, and taking us through the service and the launch. 